Captain Ibrahim Traoré's ascension in Burkina Faso reflects a commitment to steering the country toward radical reforms and reclaiming control over its resources from former colonial powers and Western nations. Traoré's leadership echoes the vision of his predecessor, Thomas Sankara, who advocated for Burkina Faso's self-sufficiency, sovereignty, and economic independence. Traoré's pledge to work tirelessly for the people represents a commitment to enact transformative reforms aimed at reshaping Burkina Faso's future, steering it away from the shadows of historical exploitation and toward self-determination. Traoré's initiative, aware of Burkina Faso's historical exploitation and eager to chart a new course, echoes Sankara's ideals of reclaiming control over the country's resources. Traoré signals a commitment to breaking free from the legacy of exploitation and fostering a new era of empowerment and self-reliance for Burkina Faso by aligning his leadership with the principles of reclaiming sovereignty and working for the betterment of the nation. Just recently, he issued an order cancelling the permits of four mining companies. You should know that these foreign companies are notorious for exploiting Burkina Faso's resources, especially gold. They made unfair agreements, using the law as a tool, and offering benefits to the earlier leaders for long-term exploitation. But this had to end, and Captain Ibrahim Traoré became the one to put the last nail in the coffin. However, what were these four companies doing that provoked a direct response from Captain Ibrahim Traoré? What blatant did they do that made Traoré so angry that he cancelled the permits? Let's know about that in this video. After gaining independence in 1960, Burkina Faso faced structural obstructions that hindered its ability to make substantial investments in its own gold mining sector. It was tragic, but France had deprived it of making any investments. Consequently, foreign Western companies were incentivized to step in and exploit Burkina Faso's gold resources. Like many developing nations, Burkina Faso experienced structural challenges such as limited financial resources, technological constraints, and a lack of expertise in large-scale mining operations. Gold mining was often capital-intensive, requiring significant upfront investments in exploration, infrastructure, and equipment. If Burkina Faso had capital and reserves, it might have invested, and things would have been quite different today. But the truth is that there was no reserve, as France literally wiped everything when it was leaving. In the past, given the challenges faced by Burkina Faso, foreign Western companies with greater financial capabilities and technological expertise have been attracted to invest in the country's cold sector. In this way, the local population and business community never develop sentiments to invest in their own country's mining sector and benefit themselves and the country. The government had no option but to recognize its limitations and encourage foreign direct investment in the gold mining industry. Governments offered incentives to foreign companies through favorable regulatory environments, tax breaks, or other concessions to attract external investment. The government of Burkina Faso might have viewed foreign investment in the gold sector as a means of achieving economic development goals, including job creation, revenue generation, and infrastructure improvement. But it did not know that these agreements would leave it in a perpetual trap. The Western companies, well connected globally, leveraged their networks to access international markets for Burkina Faso's gold. However, this contributed less to the country's economic growth and foreign exchange earnings and benefited the foreign companies more. In the pre-2000s, early exploration started in Burkina Faso. Situated in West Africa, the country boasted a history of artisanal gold mining, with geological features favorable for gold deposits. In the late 20th century, attention turned to the country's gold potential, leading to early exploration by diverse prospectors and smaller mining ventures. Initial discoveries hinted at substantial gold deposits, fueling interest in larger-scale mining, recognizing the economic potential, especially in gold mining. Burkina Faso took proactive measures. In the early 2000s, the government enacted legal and regulatory reforms to create a more attractive environment for foreign investment. These reforms streamlined permit processes, clarified property rights, and established a transparent legal framework for the future. Later, Wedge Mining, a multinational company with Western involvement, 
capitalized on Burkina Faso's reforms, initiating operations in the country, particularly at the Hande Gold Mine. Wage mining marked a significant step in foreign companies actively engaging in Burkina Faso's gold sector. Another foreign player, Etruscan Resources, entered Burkina Faso in the late 2000s, engaging in gold exploration and mining activities. Etruscan contributed to Western companies growing interest in Burkina Faso's gold resources. The subsequent acquisition of Etruscan resources by Endeavor Mining consolidated its presence in the region. Later, in the 2010s, Semaphore, a Canadian mining company with French ties, entered Burkina Faso. Focusing on the Mana Gold Mine, Semifog enhanced the country's gold production capacity. However, it benefited more from the gold exploitation, sending vast amounts of gold to Canada at the expense of the population. During the 2010s, Rocks Gold, headquartered in Toronto, Canada, with strong French connections, emerged as a prominent player in Burkina Faso's gold mining sector. Operating the Yaramoko Gold Mine, Rocks Gold added to the diversity of foreign companies contributing to Burkina Faso's gold output. Now, as Captain Ibrahim Troor learned that these foreign companies hold most gold mines in the country, he decided to cancel and withdraw permits. This was done to conserve its natural resources, particularly gold, and ensure sustainable exploitation. This action was taken to prevent over-exploitation, depletion of resources, and environmental degradation associated with extensive mining activities. Canceling permits responded to environmental concerns, such as deforestation, water pollution, and habitat disruption caused by mining operations. Another reason for canceling the permits can be to re-evaluate the mining contracts, and permits to ensure that the economic benefits are fairly distributed. Canceling permits became a strategy to renegotiate more favorable terms to the country, ensuring a fair share of profits and royalties. Not only that, but public opinion also encouraged Troor to take such a step. Political considerations and social movements influenced the government's cancellation of mining permits. It was revealed that the government canceled permits as part of a broader review of the licensing process. This involved implementing stricter criteria for granting permits. Permits to ensure that companies adhered to higher environmental and social standards besides offering fair returns to Burkina Faso. But which company's permits were cancelled? The first company is Rocks Gold, which is based in Toronto, Canada, but has strong ties to France. The company was actively involved in operating the Yaramoko Gold Mine in Burkina Faso. Another company, Wega Mining, which is part of Endeavor Mining, also saw its permit getting cancelled. You should know that Endeavor Mining, a multinational corporation headquartered in London, has prominent French participation. It oversees operations at the Hounday Gold Mine in Burkina Faso. The third and fourth companies were Etruscan Resources and Semaphote, which were also part of Endeavor Mining. As the orders for the cancellation of permits were issued, it triggered a great response within France, criticizing Captain Ibrahim Troor. It's interesting because he was criticized for safeguarding his country's natural resources and not allowing France to exploit them. Well, whether it hurts someone or not, what Ibrahim Troor has done is truly outstanding. But let's know more details of what these companies did that caused their permit cancellation. The Hyundai Gold Mine, positioned 250 kilometers southwest of Burkina Faso's capital, Ouagadougou in West Africa, stands out as a premier development project in the region. The mine is a significant producer of gold, and the ownership structure involves Endeavor Mining holding 90%, with the government of Burkina Faso owning the remaining 10%. Yes, Burkina Faso, the country with these gold mines, has only a 10% share. That was the result of the unfair agreements that earlier leaders did. You should know that a foreign company owns 90% of the total proven and probable reserves, amounting to 31 million tons of gold, capitalizing on existing infrastructure. Hyundai emerged as Endeavor's flagship low-cost mine, with a development cost estimate of $328 million. Starting construction of on-site facilities in June 2016, the mine achieved its first production milestone in the fourth quarter of 2017, with a projected annual production of 190,000 ounces.
over its 10-year mine life, covering 1,075 square kilometers of Burkina Faso's Beremian Belt. The Hyundai project predominantly relies on the Vindaloo deposit, containing 88% of the mine's reserves, while Buer and Dohun host the remaining reserves. The Hyundai mine utilized open pit mining methods, incorporating drilling and blasting. Extracted ore is transported to a processing plant with an S-ABC comminution circuit, gravity concentration circuit, and carbon in leach circuit. The processing involves a single toggle jaw crusher, an S-ABC comminution circuit, a gravity concentration circuit, and a CIL circuit. Tailings from the process plant are directed to the tailings storage facility. Access to the project is facilitated by a 1.5 km unsealed track, upgraded to a sealed 9 meter wide road during mine development. Power for the processing plant is sourced from a 2 on 25 kV power line connecting Cote d'Ivoire to Ouagadougou. A water harvest dam and a project's water needs. Lycopodium Minerals spearheaded the feasibility study, with contributions from Q Consulting, Knight P. F. Sold and Orlogy. Genevar and Orway Mineral Consultants conducted environmental and social studies. Autotech secured a $13 million contract for process equipment and services, while Komatsu supplied the mining fleet under a $38 million contract. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. Later, Endeavor Mining officially announced the sale of its 90% stake in the Bongu and Wangyan gold mines in Burkina Faso for approximately $300 million. This decision aligned with the company's strategic reorientation towards prioritizing higher quality assets. The buyer, Lilium Capital subsidiary, Lilium Mining, operates as an investment vehicle concentrating on African and frontier markets and is led by entrepreneurs from West Africa. The comprehensive consideration for these mines, classified as non, core by Endeavor, encompassed immediate and deferred cash payments. Additionally, Endeavor retained a 4% net smelter return royalties on the gold sold from both mines. Projections indicated that Bongu would generate $52 million over its productive life, while Wagonian was expected to contribute $41 million. The sale had implications for Endeavor's full-year gold production guidance, leading to a revision within the range of 106 to 1,135 million ounces, down from the previous outlook of 1,325, 1,425 million ounces. Adjustments were also made to the all-in sustaining costs, exhibiting an improvement of $45 per ounce to $895, $950 per ounce. The company affirmed its dedication to sustaining production at Hounday, which has been operational since 2017, with an annual output target exceeding 250 000 ounces, over a lifespan exceeding 10 years. Notably, Endeavor initiated a takeover bid for Kinrus Gold, which the Canadian company rebuffed. The sale underscored Endeavor's resolution to divest itself of gold mines that were situated in Burkina Faso. What's more, CMAFO Incorporation, a Canadian mining entity engaged in gold production and exploration ventures in West Africa, underwent a significant shift in 2020 when it was acquired by Endeavor Mining. CMAFO was the owner and operator of the Monomine in Burkina Faso, ranking as the third largest gold mine in the country, achieving commercial production at the Bongu Mine on September 1, 2018. The company held listings on the Toronto Stock Exchange and the Nasdaq Almanex in Stockholm. Throughout its existence, Semaphore faced associations with several controversial incidents. Allegations of severe repression of local populations emerged in countries such as Guinea, Burkina Faso, and Niger. Accusations were levied regarding its support for the corrupt regimes of Blesk, Camparo, and the military junta that succeeded him in Burkina Faso. In Niger, Senafor was entangled in strike-breaking activities, with locals protesting against the destruction of the local ecosystem and what they perceived as slave wages paid by the company. Additionally, Semaphore gained notoriety for tax evasion, allegedly evading taxes of up to 
6 million in Kenya. In Burkina Faso, Senafor ran the monamine, positioned approximately 250 kilometers west of Ouagadougou with its high-grade sieve deposit. The mineral resource resided within the Hyundai Volcano sedimentary belt, consisting of Paleo-Proterozoic rocks belonging to the Buramine basement rock. Then comes Etruscan resources, also kicked out of Burkina Faso. Operating as a gold production and development company based in Canada, Etruscan Resources managed the Yuga Gold Mine in Burkina Faso through its 90% owned subsidiary, Burkina Mining Company SA. The company had two gold projects at the feasibility stage, the Agbao Gold Project in Côte d'Ivoire and the Fincolo Gold Project in Mali. Etruscan Resources also held exploration projects covering 9,000 square kilometers in Burkina Faso, Mali, Côte d'Ivoire, and Ghana, West Africa. Another mine is the Yaramoko Mine, located in the Kande Greenstone Belt region in the province of Valais in southwestern Burkina Faso. It recorded a gold yield of 100, 000, 106, 108 ounces in 2022 consisting of two underground gold mines, namely the 55 Zone and Bagassi South, the Yaramoka mine hosts high-grade, organic gold deposits within the Greenstone. The Bagassi South Zone deposit, positioned 1.8 km south of the 55 Zone, displays surface veins with an 800-meter strike length, dipping to the northeast. Gold is commonly found as coarse free grains in quartz and is associated with pyrite. These mines are 90% owned by foreign companies. With the Burkina Faso government holding 10%, you should know that it produced 546,051 tons of gold in 2022, which Burkina Faso could use. But instead, it only got 10% of the profit, spanning over 23,000 hectares and having organic gold. The mine contributes value to Burkina Faso's formal economy by generating contracts and providing stable jobs for the local population. Moreover, it enhances the host government's revenue through income taxation, contributions to the national social security system, and royalties paid with each gold shipment. However, these taxes and benefits are lowest. All this should be seen in the context of Burkina Faso's growing ties with Rwanda and its sensational leader, Paul Kagam. Recently, Brigadier General Celestin Simporit, the Chief of General Staff of the Burkina Faso Armed Forces, led a delegation on an official visit to Rwanda from November 9 to 11, 2023. During their visit, they explored historical sites, including the Kigali Genocide Memorial, where they paid respects to the victims of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Additionally, they visited the Campaign Against Genocide Museum at the Parliament Building. The Chief of General Staff also visited the RDF headquarters, engaging in discussions with the Honorable Minister of Defense, Juvenile Marisa Munda, and the RDF Chief of Defense Staff, M. K. Mubarak. The talk's primary focus was to enhance cooperation with the Rwanda Defense Force. The Burkina Faso Armed Forces delegation also toured selected defense facilities, receiving briefings on welfare schemes, including ZIGAMA. CSS, military medical insurance, and the armed forces shop. As part of their itinerary, they visited Rwanda Military Academy, GAKO, one of the defense schools. This shows that perhaps Burkina Faso's Captain Ibrahim Trori and Rwanda's Paul Kagam want more than just close relations. It's because you in the African context, Paul Kagam's Rwanda emerges as a success story. When Kagame assumed the presidency in 2000, he faced the daunting task of rebuilding a country devastated by genocide. Despite initial skepticism, Rwanda is a stable, prosperous, unified, and reconciled nation nearly two decades later. Social services are provided to those in need without ethnic or regional distinctions, eradicating the discrimination prevalent in pre-genocide governments. However, Kagam's leadership elicits mixed feelings outside Africa. Critics characterize him as an authoritarian leader who curtails press and political freedoms, overseeing what they perceive as an undemocratic nation. Yet these critiques often neglect the historical context. Under Kagam's leadership, Rwanda has been working to establish freedoms in a country that never experienced them.
Born in southern Rwanda in 1957, Kagame's early life was marked by fleeing anti-Tutsi pogroms, growing up in Rwandan communities in Ugandan refugee camps, and witnessing recurrent oppression. Joining the National Resistance Army in Uganda, Kagame later returned to Rwanda as the leader of the RPF. At that time, the country faced significant challenges, including looted coffers, mass killings, traumatized survivors, and an impoverished population. Despite the criticism under Kagame's leadership, Rwanda has transformed from a failed state into a beacon of stability and progress. Kagame's governing style has been phenomenal, uncompromising against corruption, populism, and divisive speech. Politicians using hate-filled rhetoric consistently faced severe sentences and extended prison terms. Speeches regulated to prevent ethnic prejudice, while adjustments were made to democracy to address the Rwandan people's unique challenges. This was crucial to establish a new form of governmentality. A unified country had to be constructed with the same people. In this initiative, Kagame acted within the people's mandate and the parameters of the Rwandan constitution. His primary mission as a Rwandan leader is to protect the Rwandan people from genocide, using any necessary means. This mission, often not fully understood by the Western world, will likely be passed on to his successors for two or three generations. International analysts and democracy advocates have not fully embraced Kagame's unconventional approach, often evaluating Rwandan politics through a Western lens and overlooking the complexities of governing post-genocide. Consequently, they might have overlooked the most instructive case study in the world and national transformation over the last 25 years. From a Rwandan perspective, human rights are practiced, evident in improved maternal health care, a significant reduction in maternal mortality ratios, vaccination of newborns, a clean city, and enhanced nighttime safety. Ministers no longer require personal security details, ensuring their security like other Rwandan citizens. Progress is visible. This Rwandan viewpoint explains why, in 2015, over 60% of voters supported constitutional changes allowing Kagame to stand for re-election after his term ended in 2017. Some outsiders expressed concern that Kagame hasn't groomed a successor. However, he has chosen to mentor thousands of young men and women, with the average age of his cabinet being 40. Women comprise 50% of the cabinet. 61, 5% of the parliament, and 50% of Supreme Court judges. In 2018, Kagame chaired the African Union, advocating for game changing initiatives like the Continental Free Trade Area. African youth are enthusiastic about Kagame, often calling for him to lead their countries temporarily to fix things. The beauty of Africa lies in its renewal every 25 years, with over 70% of the Rwandan population being part of the Kagame generation. Empowered, ambitious young people free from the prejudices of their parents. While major challenges persist, Kagame is banking on the country's My Strategy, information farm employment opportunities to absorb the 250 young people entering the job market annually. With Rwanda's economy expanding by 8, 6% in 2018, ranking as the second best place to do business in Africa and witnessing significant progress in the Human Development Index, the indicators are promising. Captain Ibrahim Tror is perhaps trying to learn from Paul Kagam the art of prolonging his rule to ensure he brings all the changes he wants. Earlier, Ibrahim Tror accused African leaders of beggary during the Russia-Africa summit in St. Petersburg. He said that his generation does not understand how Africa, which has so much wealth, can become the poorest continent in the world today. He also asked why African leaders travel the world to beg. However, he greatly respects Paul Kagame, who can be his wise old man. Since Kagame has been ruling for the past 23 years, he has far more experience than Captain Ibrahim has, and Captain Ibrahim knows how to learn from this experience and use it to transform Burkina Faso. That's why Ibrahim Tror announced that elections are not a priority compared to addressing security challenges in the country. After he canceled the company's permits, a mining company headquartered in Perth disclosed that it had employed a leading arbitration law firm in response to Burkina Faso's move to withdraw an exploration permit for a gold deposit.
But this won't do any good for the company as the very agreements were unfair. You should know that following Article 113 of the Mining Code, the Ministry of Mines has cancelled 119 exploration permits due to the failure to renew them upon the expiration of their validity period. What do you think? Should Captain Ibrahim Tror cancel permits of all foreign companies and renegotiate the terms of agreements? Can Tror become the revolutionary leader who can change the entire shape of Burkina Faso? And realize Thomas Sankara's dreams? Let us know your thoughts on whether Ibrahim Tror should nationalize all the mines in the country and offer benefits to its very people. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about, the black culture, civilization, history, and evidence about how glorious blacks have been. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned.